Resurrection Day. I'm reading today as we're welcoming all of our members that are staying at home because of age and sickness and concerns. And we want to welcome all of our listening audience around the world on our Roku station, our television, our radio stations, our church antenna, our church app, our live stream, our Facebook, reaching around the world this morning. Let's welcome them to Emmaus of Kingsport. Thank you. So many churches are not having service today. I'm sure many of our friends that are normally in their own service will be listening to us today. And we pray the broadcast will be a blessing to you. First John chapter number three, I want to read three verses, verse number one through verse number three. Behold what manner of love the Father had bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us, knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it does not yet appear what we shall be because the Bible says... But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. This is one of the greatest days of the year for the Bible-believing church. The world calls it Easter, I call it Resurrection Day, for... Had Jesus not come out of the grave, every miracle he performed, everything he said, and everything he promised would be null and of none effect. Everything he said he was and is and will be depended on him getting up out of the grave. And I'm glad to report to you today that for over 2,000 years, it, uh, they're still walking in the sepulcher and saying he is not here for he has risen from the dead. And I don't dare want to take away from that fundamental Bible truth. But today I want to preach on three resurrections of every believer. Three resurrections that you and I can experience as a born-again believer. Tucked away within these verses is the revelation of three resurrections that I have an opportunity to experience and every other believer has an opportunity to experience. It's very important when you read these three short verses to see how packed it is with fundamental statements that we adhere to and believe. Number one, in verse number one, we're aware of the fact that love is the foundation of our relationship with God. God loves you. I don't know who you are listening today around the world. You may think nobody loves you. Maybe your family has forsaken you. Maybe your marriage has fallen apart. Maybe your child despises you. Maybe your parents don't want anything to do with you. And it's easy to sit down in life and feel like you are unloved. The majority of people that commit suicide, when they take their last breath on earth, die believing that nobody loved them. But in all actuality, that is not true in any case. Because God loves you. God loves you when nobody loves you. God loves you when you don't even love yourself. And what brings us into a relationship with God is his divine love toward us. The Bible also teaches in verse number one that once you're converted, from then on you are referred to as the son of God or the child of God. We belong to God. He's our father. We're not worthy of that, but we have been birthed into a spiritual family. If you're born again and so am I, we call each other brothers and sisters around here. Not because we have a common physical birth, but because we have a common spiritual birth. I'm not much, but I am a child of God. And I got a lot of faults, but there's nothing wrong with my father, I can tell you that much. With salvation, in verse number two, comes the promise. And here's what John promised. One day when we see him, we shall be like him. There is a day coming when every child of God will be like Jesus. Not in the fact that we are gods, but our bodies will be changed in a glorified form. Now, when the love of God is experienced, and we realize that our salvation will be completed when we see him face to face, 
It gives one a desire to live in a way that's pleasing unto God at all times until he arrives to take us home. Here's what the Bible said. If you really believe God loves you, if you really believe you're a child of God, if you really believe Jesus is coming again, the Bible said in verse 3, he that hath this hope, he that has that assurance, he that has that promise, purifieth himself even as he is pure. You show me the way somebody's living, and I can tell you what they think about the love of God. I can tell you what they think about being a child of God. I can tell you what they think about Jesus coming again. Because if you really embrace those fundamental truths, the Bible says it'll make you live right, it'll make you live holy, it'll make you live clean, it'll make you live above reproach. So what are the three resurrections that believers can experience? I want to give them to you very quickly. Number one, I want to talk about the resurrection from sin. Did you know when God saved you and saved me, he resurrected us from the dead? The Bible is very clear in Ephesians chapter number 2 that before we are converted, the Bible says that we were dead in trespasses and sin, alienated from God, unable to hear God, unable to see God, unable to get to God. What do you think water baptism is a symbol of anyway? Why do we say buried in his likeness, raised to walk in the newness of life? Why do we say that when we baptize? Because baptism is an outward testimony of what has already taken place in your heart. And that is you were once dead in sin, buried, but God has raised you to new life through being born again and receiving Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. So, we are raised to walk in the newness of life. In other words, our life changes because we purify ourselves having that blessed hope that Jesus is coming again. The Bible said in John chapter 20 that God sent Jesus to give us life. Well, in order to give us life, we had to be dead. The moment you were saved, you were spiritually resurrected from depravity and deadness of sin. A newness of life was placed into you. You found liberty in receiving Jesus Christ. God gave you the promise of the inheritance in the person of the Holy Ghost. He, Jesus forgave you. He's your big brother. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. You got the Holy Ghost in you. You got a Bible in your lap. You got the blessed hope of going to heaven when you die. That's resurrection, brother. You don't think being resurrected from the dead will turn you around? Look at this auditorium. You know what most of us used to do on a long Easter weekend? We'd wake up about Sunday afternoon laying in our vomit, hugging a toilet somewhere in the back of a bar room, laying in a ditch somewhere. I woke up in the back seat of cars. I didn't know who was driving, what car I was in, and what state I was in. I've got up and wondered if I'd run over somebody in the night. Don't even remember driving home. I know what it is to be so spaced out. I don't even know what life was all about. I remember them saying, man, we had a blast at that party. I don't remember nothing about it, but we sure did have a good time. And that was the way people live. You can't jump on people for living that way. They're dead in sin. That's all they know. That's the best they got. A liquor bottle's all they got. A needle's all they got. A pill is all they got. A joint is all they got. But to us that are in Christ, he came to give us life and to give us life more abundantly. We have been resurrected from the dead. With all the restaurants being closed, everybody's going through drive throughs or whatever to eat. And I went through a drive through in Kingsport the other day, and I just pulled off there in the parking lot to eat my food. And it just so happened that the front of my car was facing what it said, wine and liquor store. And I was sitting there eating my meal, and I watched a multitude of people going into this liquor store. It's called an essential building, an essential establishment. They said, we got to keep the liquor stores open. There's so many drunks in Kingsport. If we close the liquor stores down, they'd be going into DTs and filling the emergency rooms across the country. That's why they're not shutting the liquor stores down. And I stood there and I watched people young and old, male and female, black and white, take their hard-earned money or governmental money and stagger into a liquor joint 
and come out with a brown bag under their arm. I'm not mad at those people because that's the only relief they got. That's the only hope they got is to get high and get away from the pressures and the problems of this life. But as I sat there, tears began to run down my face, and the old song came to me, thanks to Calvary. I don't live like that anymore. I'm not in the cemetery of the dead. Brother Ronnie, I don't have to go to the beer joints anymore. I don't go to the dives anymore. I don't have to go to the back alleys anymore. I don't live like that. I've been resurrected from the dead. I'm a new creature in Jesus Christ. I've got life more abundantly, and I'm happy with what God has done through his marvelous grace. Oh, Brother Snap is here today in his favorite song, He Called My Name. There's Lazarus dead in the book of John in a cemetery beyond hope and beyond help. He had been dead four days. His sister indicted that he had already begun to stink. But when they rolled the stone away, Jesus said three words. And a man that was beyond hope and beyond help got up out of that grave. When Jesus said, Lazarus came forth, come forth. When he came forth, the Bible said, loose him and let him go. Many of us, before we were converted, how many of our family members looked at us and said, I don't think there's any hope for that crowd. I don't think there's any help for that crowd. He'll die just like he is but one day thank God he called our name and brought us up out of the miry clay brought us up out of a horrible pit and set our feet on a solid rock and established our goings and put a new song in my mouth even praises unto our God to God be the glory I know what it is to be resurrected no one has always been a Christian many times I hear supposedly theologians say I can't remember a time when I wasn't a Christian. That's ludicrous. That's anti-Bible. Nobody evolves into being a Christian. You're not a Christian because you were born into a Christian home. You're not a Christian because you know the Bible, you've been baptized, or you belong to a church. You're a Christian because one day you realize in the deadness of your sin, you were lost and alienated from God, and nothing you could do could bring you back into that relationship with God. It's then you call upon Christ through faith and repentance, and God forgives you and births you into his family, puts the Holy Ghost into you that promises you that's the earnest of the inheritance, and just keep that till I come back and get you someday. I give this illustration often. You can't get somebody saved until they know they're lost. you got to know you're a sinner and you're away from God. We've got some hunters in this building. They're depressed enough to get out of bed at 3 o'clock in the morning, put on their camouflage panties, climb up in a tree stand, and look like a retarded squirrel hanging off a limb at 3 o'clock in the morning. And some of them are really weird. They spray each other with urine before they get up in the tree. And I'm going to tell you something. I had a lot of problems before I got saved, but I'm going to tell you something. You ain't doing that to me. And they hang out there all day looking for a deer with thyroid trouble or a goat with thyroid trouble. That's all a deer is anyhow. Now, if a man's in a deer stand and he's getting ready to see a deer and he drops the crosshairs of that gun on it and he's getting ready to shoot it, everything's silent. It's a perfect shot. The deer's crossways. There's silence in the woods. His finger's on the trigger. The safety's off. The crosshairs are right in the front chest of that deer. And all of a sudden, from out of nowhere, somebody grabs his pants leg up in that tree stand and says, I found you! I found you! I found you! Yeah, i tell you what you found, brother. <laughs> the deer takes off, and this man's mad. He don't need you to find him. He's not lost. But you let that same man stay in the deer stand a little bit too late and forget his compass and come down out of that stand and get turned around in the woods. And I've been there, so I know what I'm talking about. You get turned around in the woods and you can't see the stars. You don't know what direction you're going in. That same man that was ready to shoot you for pulling on his pants leg, now that he knows he's lost and has no sense of direction, he's tickled to death to see you grab him and say, I found you, I found you. You know the only difference? He realized he was lost. You can preach to sinners all you want to. They're going to get offended. They're going to get mad. They're going to say, leave me alone. You're messing up my life. You're bothering me. But if the Holy Ghost ever shows them their loss, they'll be glad to see you coming down the road with a Bible in your hand telling them that they can be found in Jesus Christ. We were resurrected from our sin when we were saved. Number two, we can be resurrected from ourselves. 
You see, the Bible talks about dying to the flesh to live in the spirit. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 31, the apostle Paul said, I die daily. Now, he was, he was not referring to a physical death. He was referring to crucifying his flesh so that he could live the spirit-filled life. You hear very, very little preaching on spirit-filled living anymore because there's very, very few preachers that have ever experienced the spirit-filled life themselves. So how can they preach something to their people that they've never experienced in their own personal life? But may I say to all of my people, there is more to being a Christian than just not going to hell when you die. Jesus declared in John 10 that he not only came to give us life, but he come to give it to us more abundantly. God wants you to have an overflowing life. As long as the lust of the flesh ties you down, it'll rob you of the fullness of the Spirit and the joy of the Lord. But if you'll ever step out of those lustful desires and those drawings that'll pull you away from God and let the Spirit of God fill you up, empty yourself out of yourself so that God's Spirit can overflow in you. The Bible said in Galatians 5, you'll either have the works of the flesh or the fruit of the Spirit. I'm telling you, it was a glad day in my life when I realized that I didn't have to be miserable while I was a Christian. You don't have to be unhappy because you got bored again. I tell you, it's the greatest life that I've ever lived. It's having the Spirit of God walk in me, walk through me, walk with me. To have God's power and presence is greater than anything this world has ever had to offer me. If you'll study the Bible, yes, I'm telling it right. Now, if you'll study the Bible, there's a threefold working of the Spirit of God in a believer's life. Number one, you have the indwelling of the Spirit. That happens the moment that a person gets born again. The Spirit of God takes up residence inside you. The seed of God remaineth in you that you cannot sin. That new man has been cut away and is brand new on the inside with a person of the Holy Spirit living inside you. The Bible said if you have not the Spirit of Christ, you are none of His. Nowhere in the Bible, in the New Testament, does it teach a Christian to seek the Holy Ghost. There's not a verse of Scripture in the Bible that says that. Because you get him in his person when you get born again. But you can also have him in his power. And that comes through denying yourself, emptying yourself, and allowing God to fill you with the power of the Holy Ghost. You have the indwelling of the Spirit that happens when you get born again. You have the infilling of the Spirit that happens when you surrender your life. When you give it all to God. I remember when I was 18 and I surrendered my life to God after being saved just before my 17th birthday. One of the men in my youth department came up to me. He was a teenager as well. And he said, Brother Kid, I'm afraid to surrender my life to God. I said to him, I'm afraid not to surrender my life to God. And all of these years later, his life is in shambles. His family's in shambles. I could tell you stuff about him that's unbelievable. I look back on that now. I am so glad as an 18-year-old boy that God developed a thirst in me to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. I mean running over with the power of God in my life. I'm talking about when people say, Jesus, it makes me cry. When somebody opens a Bible, my heart does a flip. When I know it's Sunday, something inside of me gets excited. I can't tell enough people about Jesus. He's the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. We not only need him in his person, we need him in his power. You have the indwelling of the Spirit when you get saved. You have the infilling of the Spirit as you submit your life. But you can also go to another level with God, which is what we call the abiding of the Spirit of God. And this comes through just a consistent walk with God. One old timer said this, if you'll read your Bible five minutes a day, pray five minutes a day, and witness five minutes a day, you won't get far from God. Somebody said, that's awful easy, just five minutes. Have you done that today? It doesn't take much to bring you to God if the Spirit of God's living in you. But I want to live under that abiding spirit. I love when I walk in a restaurant, and this has happened hundreds of times, literally. I love when my wife and I walk in a restaurant, and from out of nowhere, somebody comes to me and says, you're a preacher, aren't you? I want that to happen. I want to be, I don't want to be a Pharisee, but I want to be different. I want to walk past people and somebody say, there's something different about that fellow right there. 
That's God's man right there. And every born-again believer can have the opportunity to be a spirit-filled Christian. I not only want you to go to heaven when you die, I want you to be happy till you get there. I want you to know the joy of the Lord is your strength. Submitting to God is the greatest thing you will ever do in your life. I'm not asking you if you're saved. I'm asking you if you're submitted. And what you have to do to submit to God is you've got to crucify the flesh. But see, we don't have the power to do that on our own. We must allow the Spirit of God to do it for us. Let me illustrate. Let's say there's a cross behind me, and I'm trying to crucify myself. I can double up my feet, take a nail, and drive a nail through my feet. I can put a nail in this hand and drive a nail in this hand. But no matter what I do, I still have a free hand. God is showing me I don't have the capability to crucify the flesh. And that shows us our dependency on the Spirit of God. He can do for you what you cannot do for yourself. You say, I've got an addiction and I can't quit it. Oh, yes, you can. Through the Holy Ghost, you can quit it. You don't have the power to quit it on your own. I don't care what your addiction is. I don't care how long you've been drinking. I don't care how many drugs are in your body. How long you've been hooked on porn and gambling and cussing and lying and cheating, stealing, damning. I don't care how long you've been hooked on that. You cannot quit it on your own. But that Holy Ghost that lives inside you, if you submit to him, deny the flesh, Get full of the Holy Ghost of God. He can deliver you from whatever addiction you might have in your life. That's the resurrection of ourself. The third resurrection every believer will go through is the one I want to close with. One day, according to the Bible, we will be resurrected from society. We're leaving this world. Now, Jehovah's Witness believe they're going to inherit the earth. And there's probably some listening to my broadcast. And I just want to say this to you. You can have it! This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My home is laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Jesus declared in verse number two of our text that he would come again. And when he comes again, he gave us a promise that we should be like him. Our bodies are going to be changed. Paul said our vile body will be changed in the moment and in the twinkling of an eye, 1 Corinthians. The twinkling of an eye is the time it takes the muscle in your eyelid to tighten up, to open up your eyelid. I looked it up the best I could scientifically, and I found out that's less than one-thirtieth of a second. One-thirtieth of a second. In less than one-thirtieth of a second, we could be out of here. And we don't even get a chance to say goodbye. But I want to stick my tongue out at the devil on my way up and let him know that the best is yet to come for every child of God. Now, some of you, what I'm about to say, this may not mean a lot to you, but as you get older, it'll appeal to you much more. One day we're leaving this world, and Jesus said, when I come to get you, I'm not going to leave you in the physical body that you're now living in. The body that we're living in now is susceptible to the contaminants of this world, but we're getting a new one. And it's going to be just like his. And the new body that we get according to 1 Corinthians 15, 50 will be a body that does not need blood. The Bible said flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The book of Leviticus said the life of the flesh is in the blood. You can live as long as your blood stays healthy. But the moment your blood starts going bad, you're in trouble. That's why when you're sick and you go to the doctor, they test your blood. Because your blood tells everything about you. And as long as you have life in your blood, you're going to have life in your body. But when we get that brand new body, we're not dependent on eight pints of blood to keep us alive anymore. We're going to be. (laughs) That's because physical blood only offers a temporary life. But when we get our glorified body, we will inherit at that moment life and life eternal. When we get our brand new body, we're not going to be limited to walls and doors and structures. It was in John chapter number 20 that the disciples were having a deacon's meeting, and Thomas was there. And all the disciples had seen Jesus risen from the dead except Thomas. And they went in the room, and they sat down, and they said, Thomas, I'm telling you, we've seen Jesus. He's alive. And Thomas said, I don't believe any of it. And they said, why? He said, well, Peter, you're a cusser. said the other day, you was cussing God in the temple and told the folks you didn't even know who Jesus was. Why should I believe in anything you say? And on this day when you said there's a resurrection, you bunch of idiots was all out fishing. I could go somewhere there, but I don't have time. 
said, y'all were fishing on resurrection morning. Two women's one you said found the empty two. You guys weren't even in church on Sabbath day. Now you're going to come in this little room and tell me Jesus is alive? I don't believe anything you got to say. Jesus was on the outside listening. But notice the Bible did not say he knocked on the door. Because when Jesus knocks on the door, it's to get saved. Thomas had already been saved. You only get saved one time. So Jesus couldn't knock on the door. Because Thomas was already saved. He didn't have a problem with the salvation. He had a problem with doubt. So Jesus walks up and he hears them communing with each other. He's in his glorified body. He doesn't want to disturb them. He can't knock on the door because Thomas is already saved. So he walks through the wall. I said he walked through the wall. The Bible said <laughs> that he appeared unto Thomas. And he took his hand and said, put your fingers in my hand. Put your hand in my side. And Thomas fell to the floor and said, my Lord and my God. I'm glad when we get up on resurrection morning, we don't have to worry about walls. We don't have to worry about doors. We don't have to worry about. <laughs> Thank God with that glorified body, we'll just step through it like Jesus does. It'll be a body without blood. It'll be a body with no limitations. It'll be a body that'll remember the people it met on earth. People ask me all the time, will we know our loved ones in heaven? I get asked that question probably at least once a month. Will you know your mama when you get to heaven? Will you know dad when you cross over that Jordan River? Will they be there to meet you on the other side? And many people disagree on, will we know each other? And this is what I use for an illustration, Brother Mark. Are you going to know your daddy? On the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus took Peter, James, and John. And the Bible said he was transformed before their very eyes. He was glorified before them. And the Bible said they fell down on their faces. And they wept and began to cry. And the Bible said they looked up. Here's what the Bible said. And they saw Moses and Elijah. Your God. They'd been dead thousands of years. Moses and Elijah had been dead for thousands of years. They'd never met Moses. They didn't know Elijah. But in that glorified state on that Mount of Transfiguration, they knew who Moses was, and Moses knew who they were. I'd hate to know that I know more down here than I'm going to know when I get over there. I'm telling you, we are going to know as we are known, is what the Bible said. You can believe anything you want. But I'm telling you, I believe when I step over that shore and I approach the throne of God, I believe I'll know my mama. I'm going to know my daddy. I'm going to know my sister. I'm going to know my son. I'm going to know my daughter. And brother, we're all going to be in a glad place. And we're going to know each other throughout eternity. We will know as we are known, the Bible declares. Time and distance will mean nothing to us when we get our new body. Everybody's on a schedule. Everybody's got a watch on. Everybody's got alarms on their, on their phones. We've all got places to go and things to do and people to see. But when we get that glorified body, the Bible says there'll be no more time. It'll all be gone. What a day that's going to be. You remember in John 20 when Jesus got up on resurrection morning, Mary reached out to touch him, thinking he was the gardener at first. And when she realized it was the Lord, she reached out to touch him. And Jesus said, well, don't touch me, for I've not yet ascended unto the Father. He said, I died as the Lamb of God on the cross, but I've been resurrected as the great high priest. And you can't touch me till I offer the sacrifice to the Father. And he took the same blood that he shed on the cross, and he took it into the third heaven. Walked past the throne of God, said good morning to the choir, went into the tabernacle of God, and placed his blood on the mercy seat of God. And I was studying this, and I found out that to leave earth and get to the third heaven, traveling at the speed of light, which is 187,000 miles a second, is the speed of light. Traveling at the speed of light to get from where I am to the foot of God's throne, traveling at 187,000 miles a second, it would take me three years to get there. Jesus tells Mary, don't touch me. I've not yet ascended unto the Father. 
But just a short time later in John 20, he walks through the wall and tells Thomas, go ahead and put your finger in my hand. Go ahead and put your hand in my side. Whatever trip Jesus had to do, he did it in just a matter of minutes. Because when we get that glorified body, I'm telling you, brother, at the speed of thought, we're going to be there. It doesn't matter where you want to go, where you want to be, who you want to be with in that glorified body. We will not travel at the speed of light. We will travel at the speed of thought. What an awesome reality. We'll enjoy the taste of food. Bless God, some of you, the only reason why you got saved is because you heard there's a marriage supper of the Lamb. <laughs> and think about it in Revelation 19, even in a glorified body, God's going to give us the blessedness of enjoying food. We're going to eat again in a glorified body. I believe grapes will be as big as bowling balls. Watermelons will be as big as Volkswagens. We'll cut them with chainsaws. Reese cups will be as big as swimming pools. Oh, dear God, we got good days lying ahead of us. Banana pudding will be so good. If you put it on your head, your tongue will beat your brains out trying to get through that bowl of banana pudding. God, even in a glorified body, has set up the marriage supper of the Lamb. The body will experience emotions in a glorified form. Because in Revelation 21, in the glorified body, God will wipe away all tears from our eyes. When we get to heaven, we'll still have emotions. We'll be able to cry. The last time we'll ever cry is in Revelation chapter 21, verse number 4. But with those emotions, we'll also be able to worship. Because worship is an emotion. And God wanted us to have that throughout all eternity. I know to some young people here, maybe... Being free from sickness and weakness and death doesn't mean a lot to you. But when you get our age and you start realizing most of our journey is behind us, heaven begins to sound sweeter all the time. Because God promised there'd be no death, no sorrow, no crying, and neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things shall be passed away. I'm looking forward to getting a body and living in a land where nobody has heart problems, nobody has high blood pressure, there's no sugar diabetes there. Nobody's on a breathing machine. Nobody's having kidney failure. Nobody's got dementia or Alzheimer's. We'll all know each other. Nobody will have blood issues. Nobody will be paralyzed with strokes. You won't hurt with arthritis. There'll be no handicaps, autism or depression. Uh, cancer and getting old and having amputated members will only be a thing of the past. Why, when we get to heaven, we won't even wear glasses, crutches and canes and wheelchairs will only be a faded memory. A hearing aid can't be found. An oxygen, oxygen machine will never be plugged in. Why, some of you old-timers, you're even going to have real teeth again. You'll never have to put them in a cup when you go to bed. Think about it. Never have another stiff neck, a joint pain. Never have anything in your body that would limit you. You'll visit in your body and be as perfect as you were in the, days, in the day that you met Jesus Christ on resurrection morning. And in that glorified body, God will allow us to simultaneously gather around God's eternal throne and lift up our hands and our voices and in one accord, all the redeemed of God that have ever been saved, every baby that had ever been slaughtered out of an abortion clinic, every child of God that was ever martyred during the dark years, every saint of God that died with Jesus in their heart and the Holy Ghost in them. Everybody that had ever lived for God, been born again, loved the Bible. On that glad day, John said, I saw thousands and thousands upon ten thousands, and we'll all gather around that throne, and we'll all sing in one accord, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Oh, what a glad day that's going to be. We'll never say goodbye. We'll never be apart. We'll never need a cell phone. We'll never have another worry. We'll never have another care. It'll all be blissed, and Jesus will be the light of the city. He'll be seated upon the throne, and the rivers of God will flow from beneath it. It'll be surrounded with a rainbow, and the saints of God will sit down on the sunny sides of sweet deliverance and tell each other about the redeeming grace of God and how we found the favor of God. And oh, what a day that's going to be when we realize we have all eternity 
eternity to praise the Lamb. So when you come to Emmaus and you hear us clap, or you see us stand up, or you see a tear running down our face, or you hear an amen, you remember one thing. We're just preparing now for that great day when we see him that is all together lovely and we look upon his face of his saving grace what a happy day that's going to be and if you get nervous down here don't go to heaven honey you'll have a massive heart attack give Jesus a hand clap of praise in the house of God today these are the days of Elijah Declaring the word of the Lord And these are the days of your servant Moses' righteousness be.